Hello, everyone. Hello, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this 10th Central Asian sub-regional meeting uh, on the uh, safeguarding of ICH. Right, today we're having this in the online format. My name is Majar Masanov. I represent the Almaty UNESCO Cluster Bureau. I'll be moderating today's meeting. Uh, the main objective of this event is to assist or facilitate the international cooperation and to create the international network of experts in the uh, ICH area, specifically to protect ICH in formal and formal education for the purposes of achieving sustainable development goals in Central Asia. The main organizer is the international uh, network uh, IC, ICH Center, uh, abbreviation of this organization is ICHCAP. This is our long-term partner and also the partner of the National Commissions on UNESCO Affairs regionally. Many of you present today already participated in the previous events that had been organized by this institution or jointly with this institution. And last year, each cup launched this regional project on strengthening of the use of ICH in education, safeguarding ICH and the educational sphere in Central Asia. This project is based on the use of experience of our colleagues from UNESCO Bureau in Bangkok and is being implemented together with the Almaty Cluster Bureau of UNESCO based on the recommendations that have been collected at the previous sub-regional meeting. So in the course of this event, we would like to discuss with you on how well this project uh, is doing uh, and discuss the possible future projects related to the strategic objectives, well, specifically to implement them on the next phase. So after this very brief historical background to today's event, with great pleasure, I just would like to pass the floor to our two distinguished speakers who will be speaking with a welcoming remark. The first one is Ms. Krista Pickett, Director of uh, Almaty Cluster Bureau of UNESCO. Please, Krista Pickett. Um, Major, thank you very much. Representatives of organizations to UNESCO, experts and partners, uh, colleagues and friends, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the 10th uh, Central Asian sub-regional meeting for the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage on behalf of UNESCO. As uh, Major said, uh, our meeting today uh, will focus on the integration of intangible cultural heritage in the formal and non-formal education systems in Central Asia. Um, and we'll be drawing on some pilot initiatives that have been supported by each cup uh, in the region. Integrating culture, cultural heritage and the arts into the educational systems, both formal and non-formal, can foster appreciation of cultural diversity as a positive increasingly multicultural societies. In order for us to counter discrimination, prejudice and violence, and to promote dialogue, peace and stability, we need to raise the next generations so they can appreciate and embrace cultural diversity and the interlinkages that have existed <laughs> in cultures and civilizations throughout the history of humankind. UNESCO advocates that culture is a cross-cutting contributor to the attainment of all sustainable development goals and ensures their sustainability. Harnessing culture in education in both formal and non-formal settings widens the perspective of development so as to enlarge people's choices beyond the economic perspective to encompass social, cultural and spiritual this sustains alternative models of development. As it specifically concerns the attainment of SDG 4 on education, it is increasingly evident that to achieve a quality education that is inclusive and relevant to our contemporary world, traditional sector-wide approaches will not suffice. Meeting all the SDG 4 targets, and target 4.7 in particular, involves re-articulating education with, within cultural contexts, establishing new and broader partnerships between the school and the community, and exploring new pedagogical approaches that develop learners' capacities to
to engage responsibly both locally and globally, improving the reach and depth of learning. In Central Asia, we are lucky to be able to draw on our networks of associated schools, UNESCO chairs and UNESCO clubs to help disseminate our messages and demonstrate the transformative power of education and culture. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought with it many challenges and drawbacks in our work, but it has also prompted us to try out new and innovative ways of working. So the fact that we organize, organize our meeting online today allows us to bring together a wider audience and draw international experts from different parts of the world. And here I would like to acknowledge Professor Heila Lotz Sisipka from the Rhodes University, as well as our UNESCO ICH facilitators, Vanessa Achilles and Janet Blake. Thank you so much for your participation. I would also, of course, like to express my appreciation to the director and colleagues of ICHCAP, with whom we have established a very solid partnership in the region. We take pride in this long lasting collaboration and partnerships um, established not only with ICHCAP, but also with UPSEU and Keris uh, from Korea. And many of these joint activities are possible thanks to the generous support of the government of the Republic of Korea. Last but not least, I would like to thank each one of you for your presence and your active participation. I very much hope that you will find these three following days of exchanges of relevance and interest, and that uh, your discussions will be meaningful and inspiring and lay solid foundations for our joint work ahead in the region. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. This was Ms. Krista Pickett, the director of UNESCO, UNESCO Cluster Bureau in Almaty. And now I just would like to give the floor to director of HCAP in the Asian Pacific region under the auspices of UNESCO. Mr. Apologies if I mispronounce your name, Kum Gihon. Mr. Kum Gihon, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, moderator, and then your pronunciation is very correct. Uh, you have a very good Korean language speaking capacity. Appreciate appreciate you much. <laughs> uh, uh, friends and colleagues, uh, I'm very happy to see you through the virtual conference. Even though uh, we are facing nearly two years. Uh, like the pandemic, but thanks to the ICH technology, we can continue to keep in touch. So it's very nice. Uh, first of all, my sincere gratitude should go to the Miss Krista Picard, a director of the UNESCO Almaty office, for co-organizing these meetings. Professor Miss Heria Lochu Shishika for keynote speech. Uh, and also I am very happy to find uh, my old colleagues, Ms. Vanessa, uh, nice to see you again here. Uh, I'm also, thank you all the secretariat, secretary generals of UNESCO National Commission for Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, for your participating in these meetings. As you all know, each cap has been holding the sub-regional NATO meetings for safeguarding ICH every year. Among five sub-regional meetings, the Central Asia meeting has opened the history since 2010. It has already been more than a decade to cooperate closely with the countries in this region. We have had many meaningful results through these meetings because of your continuous support. At the 2009 meetings, we did propose three strategic plans. One, development of the additional resource material in formal and non-formal education through, through an integrated approach between ICH and education. Second, 
establishment of an online platform for efficient management and enhanced accessibility of ICH information in Central Asia. Uh, third, information sharing and network building regarding ICH festive events along the Silk Road to raise community awareness. Surprisingly, we are achieving all these two, three strategic plans already. Firstly, each CAP, UNESCO Almaty Office and UNESCO Bangkok Office cooperated in conducting pilot class for teaching with the ICH project. Second, each CAP have launched an online platform called Ichi Links for sharing, disseminating ICH information efficiently. Lastly, we will soon establish the Silk Road Living Heritage Network in this October this year. Uh, both ICH links and Silk Road Living Heritage Networks, most Central Asia countries are actively, actively participating in, and we expecting more organizations and institutions to be our partners. This year, we would like to share the lesson learned from the ICH education project conducted in Central Asia. Same as intangible cultural heritage, education is also the area that has been hit hardest by COVID-19. Students spend less time at school and both quantity and quality of the education are decreasing as school education is switched online or delayed. We need to consider that kind of effort should be carried out to achieve quality education. In the way, ICH can contribute to achieving quality education. In addition, for ICH to be integrated into ed education, it is inevitable to think about the new pedagogical method suitable in the post-COVID-19 era. Through a three days meetings, I wish we could share the experience and discuss many creative ideas to safeguard ICH and achieve quality education at the same time in Central Asia. Once again, like my express sincere gratitude to all of the participants from the Ministry of Culture, National Commission for UNESCO, and experts. I hope this meeting will be profitable for all you and then next year. Really hope to see you in person in Korea, in Almaty, or everywhere. It's OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. After these two welcoming remarks, we actually now get down to the mainstream presentation keynote address of this event, which is going to be delivered by Helalot Sisitka, uh, who is going to join us from South Africa, from the Rhodes University. Her presentation is called Education and Culture Acting Together for the Purposes of uh, SDG promotion. I just would like to remind you that uh, she's a well-known, renowned expert who uh, specializes in various topical research, transformational environmental education, and educational system transformation. Well, apart from her key duties, she's also working at the UNESCO HQ on the second edition of the so-called training, training, training for trainers, material, material kit for the ICH in education. Um, Ms. Lotsisitka, if you can hear me, over to you. For welcoming me to the platform and also for inviting me to join you today. It feels like we can get closer together. So far, I'm sitting in South Africa and uh, your meeting is in Kazakhstan. So <laughs> it's, it's interesting to cross the boundaries. I'm going to, if it's okay, just to share my screen. So I'm just going to move 
into the keynote uh, presentation and I've slightly adjusted the title that I originally started with and I thought you know it's probably a good question for us to think about well why living heritage matters <clears throat> in advancing educational uh, advancing quality education in transformations to sustainability and especially around the SDG goal number four which is, as we all know, the goal that is promoting um, educational quality. So I'm going to talk through, you know, this question, why living heritage matters in advancing quality education, and then perhaps and also share some ideas on how we can go about doing this <clears throat> in the contemporary times. So I think the first reason why this work is so necessary is that human history is is faster, it's more interconnected, it's more complex, it's activity and it's concept dependent and also value impregnated than biological history. So as we see a biological systems changing, we also see human systems changing and these systems change as a result of activities, concepts and values that we work with. And for the most part, human history is a form of biocultural history. So culture is so important in, in, trans, in, in social transformations and in the kinds of transformations that we need to understand and bring into the world today. And these manifest, our cultures manifest in our daily activities, our knowledges, our assumptions, including in our educational paradigms and praxis. And of course, in much is held in, in ICH, and we don't always see that coming through into the education system. And at the same time, we're facing a number of planetary challenges. I think the opening speaker talked about you know, the need for inclusion, for stronger human relations, peace. He has a picture of you know, the massive issues we're dealing with in terms of uh, pollution of our earth systems and how that's affecting people and so on. So by and large, the education that we currently have in place uh, and also the development approaches and development approaches and paradigms that we have come to rely on were developed in the 17th to the 19th century to drive firstly the imperial, the colonial, the apartheid, the industrial, and now also the big data development projects. So education has really been mainly in the service of these big projects. And this continues to the present, even in many transformative learning initiatives. And I think we're gradually getting an understanding of what this is doing, is it's leaving so many people out, it's leaving their cultures out, it's leaving their learning potential out. And so we need to think about how to, to re, refigure reconfigure education. So the modernist development histories have produced, I think, what I would call a globally hegemonic culture. And this globally hegemonic culture is characterized by a dualism between nature and culture relations. We see nature as separate from people, and yet people are also natural beings. We rely on the natural world just for simple things like being able to drink enough water each day <clears throat> and so on. Cultures of patriarchy, scientism, technicism, instrumentalism, corporatism, over-individualization and ecological destruction. So this uh, hegemonic culture is heavily affecting the world's majority people, the health of our planet and other living beings. And there is no doubt that we need a turnaround or massive shift in this dominant culture. So the question for us is, can we reframe and regenerate education with alternative cultural foundations to these globally hegemonic ones? And how do we do that in the current circumstances? So this is the bigger question, I think, of why it's important for us to bring ICH uh, into the discussion with education. Of course, education itself is a very important process in our societies because education has the power to liberate the intellect, to unlock the imagination, and it is also fundamental for self-respect in the world that we're in today. It's key for our prosperity, our well-being, and it opens up a world of opportunities for people, it makes it possible for us to contribute to a progressive and healthy society and planet, and learning 
benefits human being, every human being, and should be available to all. So the question that we're dealing with really is, you know, what kind of learning do we want to have available to all? And this, I think, is the fundamental question that we're dealing with when we're talking about what is quality education. And interestingly, that, the, of course, the human brain has stayed the same for almost 400,000 years. So physically, human beings, the, the, the architecture of our brains have not, not changed, but it's our cultures that have changed. And partly our cultures have changed through what we call, we can call the miracle of condensed learning, because as we improve our ways of learning, we can learn more. And that also has a, a strong influence on our cultures. And of course, we've seen that happening, as I mentioned already, and we've seen it happening in such a way that it is actually causing problems for us now. So we really need to shift and think more deeply about what we do in education and what we do in education matters. So what can we do in such a, a context? Well, we have these two uh, areas of education that have been rising so quickly in the last 20 to 30 years or more. One is education for sustainable development that aims to empower learners of all ages to create a sustainable world, ensure environmental protection and conservation, promote social equity and encourage economic sustainability. And at the same time, we also have global citizenship education, which aims to empower learners of all ages to assume active roles, both locally and globally, in building more peaceful, tolerant, inclusive and secure society. So we have these two very progressive areas of education that are rising very strongly and quickly in, in education systems. And I think that these can be the foundation of regenerative cultures in and for education. But the, the point that I want to make, and we can see them coming together here in target 4.7 of SDG 4, which says that by 2030, we need to ensure that to promote sustainable development, including amongst others, education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, appreciation of cultural diversity and of conscious contribution to sustainable development. Because it's actually the foundation of, of, of the rest, if I could say that. And hence, I think... Um, process of redefining quality education. So if we look at some of the research that UNESCO has done, we've seen that uh, in, in glo uh, global citizenship education and in ESD, there's a, a move towards a stronger balance between, you know, cognitive style, style education, uh, social and emotional um, uh, forms of education and, of course, behavioral or action-centered forms of education. And we can see a different balance in, in global citizenship education and ESD. So it's very interesting that we're also having a discussion now in education about a, a better balance between different modalities of education and learning. And, of course, ESD and GCED bring this into the education system and help then with this, you know, restructuring of the foundations the cultural foundations of education. So this is the question that I think ICH makes us uh, focus on. It asks the question, how culturally diverse is education? Is education actually allowing our living heritage or our ICH in, or does it continue to promote a static view of dominant hegemonic cultures, for example, the technicism, patriarchy, environmental protection? nature dualism, which has produced global environmental destruction, threatening our biodiversity and our own species being. So these are the questions that bringing ICH, you know, into education raises for us. And of course, one of the things we need to be able to do as educators, if we are going to take ICH seriously, is think about how to mobilize uh, living heritage or ICH in education. And of course, one of the most beautiful things about this is that there is so much ICH, so much living heritage around us, and we only need to look 
often oftentimes outside of the school walls into our communities into our societies and we can begin to see you know so much potential for curriculum innovation for curriculum renewal for bringing new ideas into education but of course there's a question of how we can do how we should do that i wanted to share this example to just one of the, the areas of living heritage uh, and ich that i really enjoy a lot is street art because I find that street art is such a kind of dynamic form and representation of intangible cultural heritage. And here's just a couple of little pictures from different, different parts of the world where you can see here this sort of turtle, you know, coming through the, the man, the, this big pipe. And of course, that's a, a comment on, on, on the state of our biodiversity. Here's a young woman uh, with a coronavirus mask on with hope written on it. And that's a comment about, you know, the co coronavirus condition and how it's shaping our experiences of life now. Here's one about Einstein and, you know, just Google it, which is a comment about our whole society and how it's dealing with knowledge. And uh, this little one I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on and this one as well. So I often find this a very interesting way of just, you know, mobilizing living heritage and education by just starting to look around us and to bring living heritage into education. And if we were to use living heritage as a foundation of learning, in other words, if we start the learning process with living heritage that is, exists in our environment, in our communities, and if we surface that and bring it into classrooms and into formal and informal and, and other forms of learning, we have the potential to expand learning. And we can expand learning in different ways. And in this case, if I take this picture of this little uh, young woman watering a, a tree or a plant in her city, it can take us to the whole concept of urban farming, for example. Um, and we can actually go into practical activities of urban farming in our education. And we can do biology, agriculture and geography. It can take us to... <laughs> project that's uh, using data, big data uh, technologies to try to map top urban agricultural solutions around the world and make those uh, insights available to us so that we can learn more from other urban agricultural solutions around the world. And we can also begin to think about urban agriculture in the context of city sustainability. And therefore, it can take us into, you know, thinking about our futures and about the kinds of, of world that we do want in our cities. So we can mobilize mathematics, ICTs, sustainability. And we can see here that we get a much more enriched picture of of learning and the learning is well grounded it's grounded in something that is that matters to us in the community as you can see this uh, street art image is clearly signaling that this is something important to do urban renewal to bring something new into our cities so that's a, a one example and i'm going to just play with a couple of examples just to raise a, a, an issue here here's a, another example of a, a street art project in the city of cape town here in south africa there's a, a quite a strong um uh, solidarity relationship between South Africa and Palestine because of the histories of apartheid and separation and separatist de development and oppression. So in the city of Cape Town, they had a project and they, they got uh, community members to come in and, and, you know, develop the street art further. And what happened here, you can see this, there's a picture of the Palestinian flag painted as a tear in the woman's eye and also the, the colors of the Palestinian flag painted into her headscarf. And so this very interesting uh, living heritage project, which is also a, a, a political solidarity project and also a his, history project for South African uh, learners, you know, can, can, you know, be based in geography, social studies and arts and it can bring us to a long and deep discussion about human rights. In other words, we can expand learning from, from that living heritage uh, platform. 
We can go into the details of human rights. We can go into the discourses of human rights, the politics of it. And we can go into history, politics, life skills. We can go into, you know, areas of, of democracy, tolerance, law, freedom, and more as we, you know, open up this, this area of learning from the living heritage practice. And we can go into, you know, the histories and the crimes of apartheid, systematic oppression, and we're able to reflect on ourselves as human beings. All human beings are born free and equal with dignity and rights. And of course, that's a huge lesson that we've learned in South Africa over many, many years of struggle. And we're seeing, you know, other communities around the world doing the same thing. And so we can actually learn together and build solidarity relationships through this approach to mobilizing living heritage in education. There's so many other examples, and we can draw, you know, processes of mobilizing living heritage from cultural practices, for example, boat building, or cooking practices, um, textile production practices, making practices, and we can see these also, of course, all across our societies and our communities, and every community and every culture has these beautiful practices, and yet sometimes they just stay, remain hidden in the education of, of uh, communities and children. So how do we bring these in is the question. How do we mobilize them and bring them in? So here's an example from a uh, context also here in South Africa. It's a seed saving practice you can see in, in a, a township community. And here is a, a local knowledge custodian and got all these beautiful bags of seed that they are saving and sharing the diversity of seed is such a beautiful metaphor actually for, for diversity of, of heritage. And of course, one can expand uh, from here to think about what is what do we do with seed in, in agriculture and what we can learn from that is that we are reducing the diversity of seed through our types of agricultural practices and politics. We can go into communities and look at diversity of production. We can learn about indigenous knowledge systems. We can learn about um, indigenous knowledge and science. We can learn about intellectual property in the 21st century and the politics of that, the politics of seed and who owns the seed. It's a huge area of, of challenge. And of course, that can take us into thinking about indigenous knowledge systems and better uh, climate change responsiveness, where we actually need more diversity, more diversity of seed. So these are some of the things that we can do with, with living heritage. So another little example. So the reason why I'm bringing these examples is really to, to think about, you know, can we build a model that can avoid bifurcation of living heritage and education? Because I think that we can end up seeing ICH something as something separate to education. But in fact, you know, how do we avoid dividing the two and making the one better than the other? Um, and how do we make them something richer together? And this is the little model that I'm trying to work on here. You know, So if we say living heritage is a foundation of learning, that we can expand uh, learning with from our living heritages with new knowledge and experience, and we can then also evaluate what is coming up uh, in the new knowledge arena in relation to contemporary concerns that are affecting ourselves and society. And this offers a dynamism to, to living heritage. So this process type of a model is, is something that we're experimenting with and trying to research further. And I'll share with you um, some of the detail of that. So most often in the education systems, the dominant hegemonic cultures in education leave out the dynamism of living heritage as a foundation of learning. And so what we see is we see large numbers of learners across the world learning with new knowledge and experience, but it's not connected to their own lives and experiences. And so they have a bit of a disembedded experience. And so then they also experience uh, new knowledge as a technical imposition, it's decontextualized from their life experience, education loses relevance and becomes mechanistic. Um, and the social and emotional, the values in the community are left out or marginalized and the opportunities for reflexive action in own contexts and therefore also transformative learning are diminished. 
So I think that education systems and all teaching activities, lessons and programs should bring living heritage in and build on it as a foundation for expansive transformative learning. So that should help to strengthen the safeguarding, the transmission, and not uh, reduce living heritage as, as something that's outside of education, but is an integral part of it. And this does not mean that we should not teach the curriculum. We can still teach the curriculum, but it means that we need to teach the curriculum in a fundamentally different way offers more scope for critique and evaluation of the dominant narratives that are embedded in the curriculum. We can evaluate the agricultural science curriculum with that, uh, you know, uh, living heritage of diversity of seed, for example. And in this way, the curriculum can gain relevance and transformative learning potential. So if we think about the curriculum as a cultural story that we choose to tell our children, we select we make those curriculums and we use those to tell the next generation a story about our society. We can choose to tell a fuller story that is inclusive of our living heritage as found in our communities and the world around us. Or we can choose to tell a narrower story that leaves children grappling with abstract, decontextualized knowledge and oftentimes technical forms of skills acquisition. So living heritage, when seen as integral to education and when seen as, important, as an important foundation of expansive learning, enhances the quality of education, implements the principles and purposes of ESD and GCED or SDG 4.7, and it enriches the formal curriculum immensely. It brings relevance and transformative potential into education, and it also enhances learner achievement potential because learning becomes more meaningful to the learner and learning is about meaning making. So a simple principle of including living heritage can I think you know, really add to, to learner success and achievement. And in our research, we've seen that occurring each time we include living heritage, the learners are more able to work with you know, the other concepts and processes in the curriculum because it becomes more meaningful to them. So this is a very interesting uh, issue, and I think it does need a lot more research uh, at an international level. We've done research on this uh, for quite a number of years, since uh, oh, almost 10, 15 years now. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is to think about the meanings of quality education. And our first research that we did, we found that there were two very dominant meanings of quality education. One was around including learners in the in the education system so you know the EFA education for all type of agenda very important because people need to participate in education for it to be uh, even possible you know and then there's this efficiency or more of an economic discourse which is about learning a successful performance and successful mastery these two models of quality are what dominate education around the world and so what we started to do, working with communities, with uh, bearers of living heritage, ICH, looking at our environments, you know, just drawing more from, from the contexts, we started to include a sociocultural and social ecological dimension to quality education. And we were able to achieve uh, another, another focus, which is learning as connection in and with communities and society. And ultimately, we need all three of these in order to have a quality education. We need to be learning, making connections, meaning making, understanding the situation, seeing how knowledge relates to our experiences in the world. We need to be able to do that in order to be successful in an, in an education learning pathway. And we need to be able to participate fully in that. So these three concepts for guiding quality education, I think are very important. And our teaching methods, we need to ultimately include all three of them in our teaching methods. So if we're teaching just for efficiency or, or mastery of a te te technique, you know, we could lose the meaning making potential, you see. So these are important things that we've been trying to develop and trying to develop a different framework for understanding educational quality, because this, of course, influences how we measure success. 
in the education system. It influences the assessment systems. It influences pretty much everything that goes on in an education system, our conception of quality education. So we found that ICH and living heritage is very important for enabling learning as connection. And this requires full participation in learning, in other words, a democratic process. And together, these enable and improve mastery or success in learning. So this is really the, the sort of key contribution that I want to bring this morning to you. And in the context of uh, this statement that UNESCO has recently released out of the ESD World Conference, which says that transformative learning for people and the planet is a necessity for our survival and that of future generations. Time to learn and act for our planet is now. So we can see that there's a very deep and important need to advance transformative learning. And so we need models that are not going to bifurcate us into ESD and GCED or into the ICH and education, but we have to bring these together via transformative learning processes. And then I just wanted to touch on, I think the previous speaker also talked about, you know, what's happening to us as we've all been pushed online with, with uh, the COVID-19 situation. And I think that we have to ask a question, very careful question, whether we are going to be able to fully see each other and the transformation demands in our worlds via these data cultures, learning management systems, Zoom, MOOC cultures, and so on. And we have to be very clear about what we are gaining and also what we are losing. And it's been interesting to follow some of the, the debates here because you know, some people are gaining a lot, a lot of money, the Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerbergs, Warren Buffetts, as everybody goes online and has to keep buying data and so on. And then, interestingly enough, we're starting to see some educational research coming through, which is saying the things that we're losing are authentic communication, personalized support for learning, monitoring the learning process, feedback, explanations for understanding, individual counseling, and I think we can also lose local diversity in education. So ICH is more needed now than ever as we face, you know, this very challenging time in, in education because ICH can anchor us in the world that we find ourselves in and not turn us all into uh, homogenous uh, people on, a, on, a, on an e-learning platform. So these are the challenges we are facing in education. So I really do want to encourage this community to continue the excellent work. We are working with uh, UNESCO's um, Living Heritage, ICH Directorate and Education Directorate, GCED, GCED Directorates um, to bring these areas of work together. It's very, very important work. We're developing an online training of trainers course and we're still, you know, experimenting and working at art and I'm sure that all of you will be part of, you know, the dialogues that are emerging here as, as we go forward together. So thank you very much for listening to me and thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been our keynote presentation at uh, today's event. After this, we will move on to the session one. Session one is called uh, the sharing lessons learned and the, uh, the experience of regional projects of ICH integration into educational systems. A few words about the program. Uh, within the next hour, we have four presentations planned. So I just would like to ask all of our distinguished speakers, please stay within your time limit so that we could easily respond to your questions. Uh, should you get any questions in the course of the presentations, please use our chat to address those questions. I will see this uh, in chat and I will see your questions in chat and also some of our colleagues. So they will be Также я напоминаю, что у нас для следующих презентаций предусмотрен перевод. Я сейчас попрошу техподдержку показать инструкцию. То есть вы сможете э, видеть на экране 
презентацию на оригинальном языке и смотреть ее перевод на английский или на русский язык, в зависимости от того, русскоязычный или англоязычный у нас спикер. В общем, давайте перейдем сразу к первой презентации, которую проведет госпожа Ванесса Акилис. Это фасилитатор ЮНЕСКО по теме нематериального культурного наследия. Она является лидирующим международным экспертом в области в, по проекту сохранения нематериального культурного наследия в Азиатско-Тихоокеанском регионе. Она долго работала в бюро ЮНЕСКО в Бангкоке, курировала программы по нематериальному культурному наследию. В этой связи мы всегда рады видеть наших коллег из офиса ЮНЕСКО в Бангкоке, в частности, в, которые здесь с нами присутствуют, в частности, руководитель отдела культуры госпожу Хан. А, в общем, передаем слово госпоже Акилис. А, она будет демонстрировать свою концовую презентацию на английском, а мы постараемся подключить презентацию на русском языке параллельно. Спасибо. I would like to thank you very much for inviting me here, and uh, and I'm really happy to be part of this conference together with our colleague, I mean, there is Saniya and Camilla and Minjung, and uh, also our colleague, our, our chief of unit from Bangkok, Long Beach Han, who are all part of this initiative, and we can, of course, uh, intervene and, and bring more examples to what I'm going to, to talk about now. Okay, so, uh, well, thank you very much also to Ayla to uh, bring up this uh, original topics, uh, because it's uh, fitting very well with what I'm going to talk about, all the, the issues and then really important questions that she raised. I do hope that with this project, we started to give uh, um, a bit of uh, an answer to at least some aspect of it. And uh, we have been conducting this project on teaching and living with intangible heritage in Asia Pacific, including Central Asia. And uh, what I'm going to show you here are some of the resources for teachers that have been developed or are being developed uh, as a result of these uh, pilots in many countries, thanks to the support from ISHCAP and APSIU. I would like to say that all this project was, of course, conducted within the framework of the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, uh, that we are talking about ensuring that living heritage can be transmitted, included through formal education, and these projects took place in, uh, in schools. Uh, as you all know very well, living heritage, or ICH, is extremely diverse. And uh, thanks to uh, this, I mean, this diversity is, uh, is crucial. It becomes a fantastic resource for education because we are talking about the heritage of students and their families, uh, of the teachers, of the communities surrounding the schools, and of course, much broader, uh, the living heritage of, uh, of the, the worldwide communities. So it is everywhere around us and it's really a resource we can tap in. Um, to create meaning in the school system. So these lessons learned uh, come from uh, school activities that took place in 10 countries in Asia Pacific. We had an original project back in 2012 and 13 in six country, in, in, several, in four countries. And now uh, we have been working with uh, Korea, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Nepal in the, this last round. And uh, the main objective of this project was to try to reconcile this two big, big goal, major goal of uh, the culture sector, which is the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage and uh, of the education sector to have quality education. And Leila, of course, Leila talk, of course talked to us at length about uh, education, education quality, quality and quality quality under, under SDG 7.7. So when we talk about ICH in school, what do we mean? Um, we, we have two ways of understanding that. One way is to talk about teaching about ICH, which means learning about the origin and the meaning of living heritage and how to practice this heritage. So basically ICH becomes the subject of instruction. And this is some uh, thing that has been already taking place in some schools, sometimes through like music class or, or arts and craft class uh, or through school clubs. 
but uh, we also want to go beyond this and uh, we have seen already some examples for instance about the seed banks or, or human rights topics and uh, and we are talking about teaching with uh, living heritage it's when ICH uh, offers many learning opportunities to enrich the teaching and learning process and it, it can be applied to all curricular subjects and to all uh, school activities in this case ICH uh, becomes, in a way, a pedagogic tool. Although, of course, when you start talking about uh, teaching with ICH, so for instance, one of the common examples that we have had is to use uh, um, like uh, many crafts uh, which uh, provide geometric um, uh, geometric shape, uh, or many like which we are talking about a building craft or embroidery or weaving etc it can be of course directly connected to math class uh, but when you learn with this craft and when you learn geometry through this craft at the same time you learn about the craft itself and about its meaning and value in the practicing community so uh, this is a really a new approach to teaching and learning uh, which is very much connected to the students' context and culture uh, to personalize the learning and to make it more relevant, more engaging, more exciting, and much more practical. The approach that uh, we, we have used is, uh, has been uh, valid for all teachers that we can talk about uh, primary schools or uh, kindergarten or high schools. Uh, it has been applied to all subjects, uh, whether we are talking about humanities or languages or scientific subjects or physical education or social sciences. Uh, it has been applied to many subjects inside the curriculum, uh, directly in curricular lessons, and also to extracurricular activities. So uh, it encompasses six very practical steps that we will uh, see later. Uh, the first round of the project, we didn't really have uh, methods per se, and the teachers that we were working with were finding it a bit confusing. So we have tried to establish a sort of process, which of course can be customized to, to the different, to different contexts, but it provides some guidelines. And the objective has been to create a very contextual lessons. So here, for instance, you can see a team of uh, Nepali students and uh, they have noticed that one of the teachers has noticed that um, there are traditional uh, later makers in the communities around the school. And he has built his trigonometry lessons, uh, talking about angles and, and, and measurements, etc., uh, directly around the concept and the, the practice of this uh, ladder making. So the lessons were really practical. We had a little bit of theory, but then they were making uh, a ladder, they were building it, so it was really fun and really engaging, and the students really see. So the, uh, the purpose of this trigonometry exercise, because at the end, they had something very concrete that is used in their community. It also helps develop uh, students' critical thinking. Uh, so here we have a group of Thai students who are actually uh, trying to, to, to find a way of how they can help promote the very important craft that is in their community. And they ended up with a virtual reality project, augmented reality projects to document some of the crafts. So uh, it has been uh, involving some research, some uh, analysis, uh, some IT skills, was a very complete uh, set of activities that really involve their, their problem solving skills. Uh, this approach has also helped foster global citizens. This is a class in Korea, for instance, where uh, really the teachers went from through uh, global heritage to local heritage to understanding local practices and really try to connect the local and the global and the various identities. And of course, it helps uh, appreciate the local heritage um, because the students are often aimed at practicing it. So here we have, for instance, some uh, uh, glass work on, on, on wood that is done by students in Thailand, again, as part of one of their practical uh, project, art, art project. So now to go back to uh, the six step methodology that uh, we have approached, I can uh, briefly uh, explain you 
the, the main uh, aspects of it. Uh, so the first step really has been to understand the context, which means identifying the ICH, which is in the environment. Uh, and this can be done by the teachers, by the students, by the parents, by the communities, by uh, the school management. So it can really be an exercise of uh, um, a, a group exercise or a collaborative exercise. And um, which goes hand in hand with identifying partners in the schools, in the community and beyond. It can also involve museums, et cetera, because the teachers do not have to do everything by themselves. Um, identifying the type of activity that would work, maybe developing new curricular lesson is the way to go, or maybe having uh, some specific extracurricular clubs uh, would be a way to start and when to schedule these lessons and activities uh, efficiently. Uh, because if you have a festival come, for instance, it can be an extremely good time to actually um, um, uh, work with intangible heritage before and during the festival to really enhance the meaning. That's what happened in Korea with the Lantern Festival, for instance, where the, the students were learning the meaning of the festival beforehand and be building the lanterns. Uh, the second part, uh, the second point is to select the, the living heritage and connect it with the school subject, or one or several school su subjects as entry points, because we, we can start either from one uh, living heritage element and see how it can uh, fit into different topics. Uh, but there was also another approach, which is actually to look at one subject and the learning objective of these subjects and uh, to try to identify a diversity of living heritage elements that could uh, fit into very different lessons. And of course, it's important to take into account the student's interest and to, to look at resources and constraints. Uh, if you want to do an activity that requires a lot of travel, does the school has the resources to organize this travel, logistic and financial, for instance. Of course, it's very important to learn more about the intangible heritage because uh, as much as possible, uh, we want to dive deep into the value to transmit them through the process of learning. Um, so uh, we are looking at what kind of information can be collected and how it can be collected either through desk research or what is encouraged whenever possible is to do um, to do really field work and engage even the students in this field work in collecting the information themselves in interviewing people. Here we have Vietnamese teachers who are actually documenting uh, the work of an artisan, but we had in the last project several students group going directly in the communities to interview people and understand uh, what really such craft or, or such practice was about. Of course, keeping in mind all the ethical principles that are important for the safeguarding of living heritage. Then uh, there is the step of uh, designing lesson plan or activity plans and teaching. And each in this uh, in these steps, it's uh, we are really highlighting uh, how to show that the living heritage add value to the lessons by uh, integrating it inside the goals of the lesson, inside the learning objectives. Um, by making it more visible, more prominent, and also by integrating some goals or some learning objectives that relate to the awareness uh, about this living heritage. Um, there can be a number of teaching and learning methods that are applied. Of course, this is up to the teacher to be creative. Usually um, in, uh, in this kind of approach, all the um, the, the student center methodology are, are working very well, where the, the students are, are participating, group work, and then gallery walk, etc. Um, having um, pedagogical materials that are reflecting the ICH is also important. Having practical you know, objects, tools, having the, the students practice it really add a layer of depth in the learning process. And, uh, and, and this work encourage the, the students to respect diversity and tolerance. This is especially important in class, in multicultural classrooms where different students or students from different backgrounds can, can bring their respective knowledge and compare their respective practice and 
really discuss and try to develop mutual understanding about, uh, about their own communities. Um, we are encouraging uh, the teachers to document and share their experience uh, at school, of course, um, for themselves, with their colleagues, and also through network online, and also with the communities. There have been a number of um, uh, initiatives where the community is invited to a special celebration um, at the end to, to see the results of, uh, of what the, the students had learned through, through this uh, project process. And, uh, and when you have like uh, networks like the ASP network, these are also extremely good uh, platform to, to share the experience and, and, and provide more examples and inspiration to other teachers. And uh, it's of course extremely important to evaluate the results, to evaluate the students' learning outcomes. Uh, in terms of uh, academic learning, but also in terms of their awareness and uh, interest in the living heritage. And uh, usually all the pilot shows that the level of uh, interest and, and, and um, excitement about the ICH is uh, really growing through this process in of learning in the school. So, uh, how has this methodology been applied and what resources do we have? Uh, um, we have developed with the Bangkok office an animation series. There are six uh, short video clips or cartoon videos, uh, which explain uh, what is teaching with intangible cultural heritage, what does it mean, why is it important, and then what, if you're a teacher, what can you do? If you're parents, how can you contribute? If you're a school manager, how can you support the teachers? And if you're students, how can you keep your heritage alive in school and outside of schools? These short videos are a very good uh, introductory snapshot to get a grasp of the ideas. Um, and then there are a number of additional tools um, we are in the process of developing a guide for teachers that includes several tools, such as uh, reference to connect ICH and, and subjects like different uh, inspirations, uh, tools to gather information, especially at community level, uh, how to connect ICH and GCED, um, several uh, real life case studies and, and many on useful online references. Most importantly, this, uh, all these tools are based on very practical examples from pl real classroom ex uh, experiences uh, with many ideas for lessons and activities that actually have been tested by teachers in, uh, in Southeast Asia and in Central Asia and in uh, East Asia. We are also in the process of developing an online course in five modules. Uh, Module one would be about what is teaching with uh, living heritage. Module two is understand your context. Uh, number, module three is about uh, how to select the living heritage and element and learn more about it. Module five is about designing lesson plans and activities and evaluating them. And module, um, module five is about going beyond this and how to really integrate living heritage in real school ac activities. So strategies for, for instance, uh, um, multicultural classrooms and how to deal with that and how to really connect with GCEDs. So as you can see, these modules are uh, more or less following the methodology and going beyond, uh, beyond it. Um, it's very practical also because each module will guide the participants in developing its first lesson plans in a, in a guided manner. So uh, really uh, what we see is that this set of resources are a way to start discovering living heritage in schools, how it has been used in the past. So discover different methods and reflects on, uh, on, on the benefits of it and how it can be uh, applied in various contexts for teachers. It's uh, very, um, I mean, the, the steps are quite, um, quite clear, uh, but of course the teachers are encouraged to try and adapt them to their own context. Uh, and most importantly, to share their resources because I think at this stage, this is fairly a new approach and it's uh, very important to show 
the um, successes of uh, of everyone uh, and to 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 provide a new source of inspiration. Of course, this is uh, it's really important to to highlight that this. Uh, project is the result of collaboration between many, many people, like school managers, school teachers, uh, community members, etc. And of course, all our partners and um, from uh, ISHCAP and APCU and UNESCO in the different field offices. And this reflects also what this methodology, methodology is about. It's about collaboration and, and support, uh, because ICH is a is a community practice and then bringing ICH in school is not something that you will do by yourself individually. Having the community around you, even the students being community members and family being community members is very important and will be one big step in the process. So thank you very much. I hope I kept to the time. And uh, now we will uh, pass over to our second presentation. Um, about which uh, some people have already been asking in the chat. It's a presentation of our expert from Kazakhstan, which will be de dedicated to pilot lessons in the framework of the project that was described by the previous presentation. And uh, uh, the speaker will be uh, Sanya Bajeneva, who uh, has uh, been through several training uh, trainings uh, of UNESCO on the um, uh, enhancement and expansion of uh, ICH uh, um, experience in uh, Central Asia, and she was managing this project in uh, Kazakhstan. Please, the floor is yours, Ms. Ms. Bajeneva. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished colleagues, distinguished experts and friends. I'm really very glad to see all of you here. And uh, let me share uh, the results uh, of uh, project implementation in, in Kazakhstan uh, on uh, uh, teaching with uh, ICH in the uh, uh, Asian uh, Pacific region. Uh, therefore, uh, talking about the steps of project implementation, we have decided uh, jointly with the uh, UNES uh, UNESCO office in Kazakhstan, we decided to um, uh, select uh, the uh, UNESCO associated uh, schools for this uh, pilot project. And we conducted uh, the uh, uh, learning uh, workshop from the 11th through the 15th of January, which uh, uh, also was uh, uh, the follow up of the introductory meeting uh, conducted on the 15th of December 2020, because it was very important for us to uh, tell the teachers what's uh, going to be the timelines of the project implementation, what's the plan of actions. And uh, also there were, uh, we uh, uh, also uh, showed interest to three uh, teachers of different subjects. And uh, also one member uh, from the school management joined this project as well during the training. Uh, and after the training, the teachers were analyzing their curriculum. And uh, upon uh, analysis, they were taking the decisions on uh, concerning the grade or, uh, for example, the time or the element that might be uh, is ICH element that might be integrated into the teaching process. Then we were jointly discussing uh, the partners who could have been involved into the implementation of this project. And uh, um, when we were discussing uh, likelihood of uh, availability of uh, the teachers who are already using ICH in there, uh, teaching process. Uh, for example, if we take ICH, maybe we can uh, invite uh, the uh, colleagues of our teachers uh, uh, teaching other um, uh, subjects, uh, as well as uh, other uh, experts and maybe parents for implementation of this project. And the implementation of the project itself and uh, devising the extracurricular events as well as the curriculum itself. Vanessa has already shown uh, all the uh, steps of how such projects uh, should be implemented and, and what concrete steps uh, are supposed to be fulfilled. Every teacher picked up uh, uh, the grade and the time uh, for uh, the lessons because it, as it has already been mentioned before, if uh, uh, we uh, would have invited the experts, then it would have been necessary also to uh, comply with their time schedule. And it was uh, necessary to pick up an element, ICH element, and we were um, also recommending the elements uh, that were 
uh, also uh, were considered to be the bearers of uh, some ICH elements. So we conducted this element as well. Um, and uh, uh, then we picked up the materials and uh, uh, first of all, uh, we mean the materials provided to us by uh, UNESCO and uh, out of all pilot projects that have already been implemented before. Uh, then we analyzed uh, what uh, uh, literature will be required, uh, video, audio materials or other pedagogical materials. The teachers were working very uh, diligently on this step. Uh, and uh, I would like to note also that the uh, management of the schools also supported us uh, very much and uh, so that uh, we could invite, uh, uh, for example, jewelers, musicians, uh, uh, the craftsmen uh, who were producing musical uh, instruments, depending on the uh, selected uh, ICH uh, element and uh, depending on the topic. Uh, talking about the numbers, as I have already mentioned, uh, we um, selected three uh, schools uh, with uh, three uh, teachers and one representative of the school management. Uh, the total number uh, of the uh, trainees was 235, 111 uh, girls and 125 boys. Uh, the number of uh, schools uh, uh, that uh, uh, the number of lessons that we conducted in that uh, pilot project was uh, 20 and uh, as a result, uh, we uh, also um, um, uh, used uh, the school Dostare uh, and uh, Germa Germa Ber uh, uh, from uh, the gymnasium uh, school number 153. Let's take a look at uh, how it happened. I would like to mention right away that in the course of uh, the implementation of this uh, particular project, uh, we had various changes in the uh, selection of the element, uh, living heritage element, or uh, in the uh, to the approach uh, uh, to integration. But I would like to say that uh, Dostar School decided to pick up this uh, Shejere element even before that. And since all the teachers were pretty familiar with this element, and th since they have decided that it will be very important for biology, history, and the uh, Kazakh language, it will be very convenient to use uh, Shejere uh, elements as uh, a um, cutting through element. And this is the reason for which they have decided to use uh, and to work with this uh, element. And uh, uh, then uh, through the history of the family, uh, the uh, teachers were learning about the Second World War, uh, the uh, Kazakh and uh, in the Kazakh uh, language and the literature, thanks to Shejere, they were learning more about the uh, relationships uh, between various families. And uh, also they were conducted uh, the debates and uh, then there was a presentation of their family trees. As you see, the, uh, teacher, uh, the, the students were putting together the genetic trees and and uh, uh, they were integrating their, the uh, pictures of their relatives and uh, they made kind of banners. Uh, the second uh, school, it's uh, the uh, school gymnasium uh, number eight uh, into which uh, the teachers of English, Kazakh and history were participating. Uh, the English uh, teachers uh, uh, decided to use uh, the ICH as uh, the main uh, topic of the uh, lesson since different elements of ICH were analyzed uh, um, uh, typical for various communities uh, in China, and they were discussing uh, the uh, traditional um, knowledge and uh, advanced uh, technologies. Then the uh, teacher of Kazakh uh, uh, decided to uh, use ICH as a pedagogical tool. And thanks uh, to the uh, learning of how to uh, produce uh, traditional jewelry, they were uh, uh, learning uh, uh, various uh, proverbs and sayings and uh, conducted interviews with uh, a practitioner and the parents and uh, the uh, students of the sixth grade uh, in its uh, curriculum already have this topic. This is the reason for which it was pretty easy for them to arrange everything and uh, the ICH uh, uh, elements uh, were actually an entry point to integrate the ICH into the educational process. History, the teacher of history uh, also uh, decided to pick up history as uh, the subject of the lessons uh, because uh, this topic was already approved in their curriculum. And they were talking about the traditions of uh, producing Kazakh yurtas. And the teachers uh, uh, and uh, the students uh, were 
discussing the connections with the uh, tangible culture, with the dwellings and objects, what skills are required for this. And the teachers try to model a yurt. Therefore, uh, the uh, school gymnasium number eight, unfortunately, during the uh, implementation of this uh, project, it was on quarantine. This is uh, the reason uh, for which all the lessons were conducted in online format. But as we see, it did not uh, affect negatively uh, on the involvement and the uh, interests of uh, teachers and uh, students. As you see, uh, the uh, uh, students were conducting interviews with their uh, children, uh, and they were telling us stories about their family values and included uh, the um, uh, idea of uh, uh, the value and the significance of ICH. And I would like to uh, mention that when uh, children were interacting with the teachers or parents, uh, usually uh, we uh, receive their uh, free uh, written consent. Uh, for example, if uh, they wanted to record an interview with their parents, uh, even if uh, some parents wanted to share their information, but they did not want to uh, be uh, video recorded, uh, this is the reason for which we decided to take into consideration and uh, show respect to their opinions. Therefore, all these concepts actually were based on the uh, written consent of uh, uh, the participants. Uh, the next approach uh, was uh, uh, developed by uh, school number 153. Uh, the first teacher was uh, the teacher of uh, Uyghur language and literature. The second is uh, uh, the teacher of uh, history. And the third one is uh, the teacher of music. Uh, the first teacher of uh, uh, Uyghur uh, decided to pick up the uh, craft. Uh, for example, uh, the production of uh, um, uh, cups uh, from the uh, pumpkins and uh, the uh, uh, students uh, could actually learn uh, about the uh, traditional craftsmen and the uh, oral uh, traditions of Uyghur's uh, history through the ICH uh, uh, using uh, or referring to various uh, sacred places available in Kazakhstan. Uh, the ICH uh, uh, became also an entry point for uh, learning more about ICH. Uh, music, um, uh, the teacher was using such elements of ICH as uh, the legends and Kui, and, uh, uh, the, which are the elements of uh, Uyghur and Kazakh uh, peoples. And uh, some of the events, uh, um, it was possible to conduct them online and others offline. And uh, therefore, uh, talking about the somatic uh, research, as I have already mentioned before, I would like to uh, note uh, that, the first of all, the teachers were very much involved, that they were very much interested, and they started learning more about this element. They started uh, uh, learning more and deeper about this element uh, together uh, with the students. And all the uh, uh, teachers also uh, mentioned and uh, noted increased uh, interest uh, to this uh, el in this element, and they have uh, uh, seen that uh, any uh, school knowledge can be very useful and can be applied in their practical everyday uh, work. Uh, they were also interacting with the teachers and uh, students from other uh, grades uh, who were not participating in the project, and they requested them. Uh, for example, uh, during the lesson of uh, the Kazakh language, they invited a, a student uh, from the 11th grade who told them about Kui and uh, who uh, played Dombra. And since uh, uh, this uh, uh, student is uh, 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 coming from the uh, family of uh, Abai Kunanbaev, a very famous uh, poet, Kazakh poet, and uh, he also told about his uh, Shejire, which was really very uh, interesting for the students. As you see uh, here uh, on the picture, uh, you see the presentation of the students' projects, and one of the students uh, uh, managed to uh, um, restore her um, her genetic tree uh, up to the 16th uh, century. And what was uh, really very interesting is that many uh, students uh, decided to establish uh, uh, connections with uh, many other uh, relatives who 
uh, with whom they were not uh, communicating before, who sometimes uh, live on different uh, continents. Therefore, the barriers of such ICH uh, elements and the connection with them uh, was enhanced. Talking about the thematic topic, it was uh, the uh, school uh, event, and actually it is uh, an annual event, which is usually conducted during uh, in spring, because in spring everything is blooming and the new uh, the life is renewed. And again, um, uh, offline uh, mode was available only for the uh, low grade uh, students and the speakers decided to pick up in the framework of this festival, a conference, a scientific conference for the students of the uh, primary school and the uh, students who were very much willing and expressed their willingness and desire to participate, they were interacting with the teachers of different subjects. Basically, once there was this lady student girl who decided to tell how to make a jug out of pumpkin. So basically, this young lady, she planted this pumpkin in her vegetable patch. She watched it to grow, then she knew what kind of definitions were used in Uyghur languages, how to call different stages of the pumpkin growth. And then they learned about those. Well, basically she also met the guy who was able to turn those beautiful pumpkins into nice jugs. So basically he told her about the whole process. So they also invited the expert, some uh, postgraduate students, student in chemistry who commented on every performance and how Sania. the plants, Sania? Yes, I'm almost over, almost over. Well, here you can see that children, uh, they practically grew some of these plants and they actually asked their parents, grandparents, uh, the members of the community, how to use these particular plants in the day-to-day -day life and what kind of medicinal properties those might possibly have. So they shared some of those recipes and some of the key challenges that they had. First of all, it wasn't really clear what were the specific deadlines because some of the events were planned, but then they were canceled because of the lockdown measures. So that is why this is probably the biggest problem. The next problem was that when the teachers, they got used to the ICH concept, basically getting used to the ICH concept, the integration of ICH into the teaching process, and also understanding the principles of education and the spirit of global citizenship. It was really hard to draw, uh, to draw those parallels, but the teachers, uh, overcame these successfully and some feedback was collected from some of the school students. So basically there are certain phrases on the screen, some quotes that were collected, some of the feedback from teachers. For the inspirational purposes for some of the other teachers, this would be great. This is it from my side. Should you have any questions, please write to me in chat. I'll be happy to respond. Well, I suggest that since uh, there are no questions in chat. We'll move on to the next presentation. And the questions uh, to Ms. Bajaneva, should we have any questions pending, we will be able to get back to those after all of the presentations. So we're going to have the third presentation that is basically about the same project and the pilot classes, pilot lessons, but in Kyrgyzstan. And this is by Kamila Kenjitaeva, also the local expert ICH expert and who as a previous speaker also participated in the UNESCO trainings and handled the project, managed the project in her own country. Please. Thank you, Major. Hello. Uh, hello again to everyone. So here you hopefully can see and hear me well. Yes, we can hear you well and we can see your PowerPoints. 
While speaking about the organization of the project in the Kyrgyz Republic, the project lasted from November through July. It all started immediately after the TOT uh, training by UNESCO. The information session was organized with the National Commission on the UNESCO Affairs, the National Coordinator of the Associated Schools in Kyrgyzstan, where the uh, well presented the goals and objectives of the projects and the selection criteria for the schools to enroll into the projects. Three schools have been selected in Kyrgyzstan, also with a count of UNESCO recommendations and in the light of the COVID situation in the country. Also, we focused on the selection of the participants, specifically the teachers in those selected schools. And we're trying to notify our pilot schools, trying to convey the message about the project. December and January were dedicated to preparation of training, translation of the materials, adaptation to the local context, uh, handling the trainings, then gathering feedback from the participants and the discussing discussion of the idea with the teachers and what kind of activities they would like to handle, what kind of elements they would like to integrate and how to, what particular format could be used to facilitate all of that. From February through March, we were heavily involved with the project implementation, specifically developing a work plan to have a very clear understanding what, what we would like to achieve, what are the specific end results or outcomes we would like to see, the teachers were involved with the class plans development, lesson, cl lesson plans development, uh, looking for the carriers of ICH who could participate, uh, the, kept the online and offline contacts with the parents, school administration, uh, conducting classes, collecting documents, collecting the lesson plans, pictures, videos, and visits to schools. So basically it turned out to visit our schools. I was really pleased about that because we had a very intense situation, intense lockdown. June, July, we organized this original meeting uh, the, through the effort of the Almaty Cluster Bureau. Uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan teachers were able to share their experience of conducting this events, feedback from teachers and students, translation of all of the materials and submitting these materials and reports to UNESCO. The participants of the pilot project included three schools, Elim school number 95 and Harvard International School. Those were selected based on the recommendations of the National Commission and the, uh, no, the uh, one of these schools, the, the UNESCO Associated School. Totally, we selected 14 participants, 10 of whom were teachers and four the representatives of the school administrations, school management. Five of the teachers were primary school teachers and five were uh, middle school. So basically the typical subjects they taught, history, music, uh, languages and literature, geography, and well, some other subjects. What is most interesting throughout the project implementation, our teachers were able to motivate and involve some of their colleagues into the facilitation of the projects related activities. Well, basically we were joined by 18 more teachers, specifically through uh, the uh, school-wide events implementation and also through the information or awareness meetings in schools. Several teachers in different schools, they uh, wish to join the project. So totally in this project, we had over 32 teachers involved, starting from primary school to middle school. So here you can see uh, the, some of the pictures of students who participated in our schools in Elim and Harvard School, 195 uh, students 
also participated in those events. So totally in Kyrgyzstan, as part of the project, more than how many? More than 300 students totally participated in the project related activities related ICH. Training for teachers was organized back in January, lasted for the two full days in the UNESCO Associated School, consisted of two parts. Part one was about uh, basically about the convention, the ICH topics. Part two was a practical hands-on where they had more group tasks to complete specifically related to the development and preparation of the lesson plans. Also, teachers who had some experience in teaching ICH, they had uh, they had opportunities to share their experience with the others. We had some really good feedback from teachers after having this training. So basically, they learned that uh, well the. Uh, reported they were able to learn more about UNESCO, about its activities in the area of culture, in heritage, uh, understanding of ICH, more profound understanding of the ICH topics, the contemporary situation, and efforts related to the ICH safeguard in Kyrgyzstan, difference between tangible and non-tangible uh, heritage or life heritage. Well, despite the fact that some really good uh, number of examples was case studies was given to the teachers. Teachers wanted to learn more to be a bit more convinced. They wanted to learn more about the various teaching techniques and experience of the other teachers. Speaking about the uh, work planning techniques or work planning approach, well, basically each school approached this differently. Elim, this is one of the associated schools when drafting their plans, they were based on various ICH topics. The other schools decided to concentrate on their own school plan and what they were based on when, when they started planning initially. Totally, we had about 30 different activities that included uh, both classes about ICH or with the use of ICH, also conferences, master classes, school plays, uh, school wide activities, and also what I would like to know the creation of the ICH museum. So, here I also would like to note the support from the school administrations, school management. They supported the project in every way possible and also facilitated the museum, ICH museum opening in their school. Methodological <laughs> guidelines by UNESCO, these were quite useful, both, both uh, preparation of training and handling the trainings and also throughout the project implementation phase. Specifically, the most used materials, according to these teachers' feedback, was the step-by-step -step guide uh, step by step approach, uh, examples of this class plans or school plans, and also the uh, specific ICH class, what it is, what is ICH. So basically, all the teachers were offered to have a special ICH class or introduction into ICH in order to introduce them into the topic of ICH. According to the teacher's feedback, well, we turned out to have uh, some very good, <laughs> some very good outcomes here. Some very good, well, uh, highly positive uh, project implementation results. So the teachers realized that they've been able to enrich the teaching techniques with the ICH components. They made their classes lessons much more interesting. They wanted. Uh, they were able to involve more students, not just into learning the subjects itself, but also going profoundly deep into ICH topics. The use of ICH resulted in the development of the new skills. The master classes organized by our teachers jointly with the local communities, uh, individual tasks for school students, strengthening connections and communications, not just amongst the students, but intergenerational ties. 
well, involvement of parents, grandparents, they were helping our school students to prepare uh, their classwork. They participated in the school activities whenever possible. And of course, the communication amongst the teachers, not just within one particular class, but also high school with middle school and middle school with the primary school. The project resulted in a great awareness, not just of teachers, but also students and also the parents who helped uh, administrations that supported these projects and also the local community members. Establishing contacts with the local community members, this was one of the achievements or outcomes of the project because involving the carriers of ICH enabled to make these classes and master classes much more life and much more involving. And as teachers noted in their reports, the goals and objectives of training were mostly achieved. Of course, when implementing the project, they were, there were certain difficulties, certain complications. Mostly this was because of the COVID, because of the great incidence of the disease amongst both students and teachers. Teachers were also lacking some time. They needed some extra time to handle classes, to conduct classes. And also some teachers needed some extra time because some of the practical classes with the help of the local community involvement, they required more time. Well, basically because the theoretical part would be delivered by teachers and the practical part by the local community members. So in the normal class time frame wasn't sufficient. Uh, the students' motivation, this is mostly about the motivation of high school students. They were mostly interested in, well, in enrollment and to high educational institutions, but amongst some of the feedback, we got the feedback from the high school students who responded that well, they were interested in studying ICH topics because this would help them to understand their cultural heritage, regardless of the fact, regardless of the fact that they are going to enroll into foreign universities and they were all, all going to study overseas. They wanted to understand their cultural heritage anyway. They wanted to tell about this to their school student mates overseas. For many of the teachers, this was the first experience of participating in this project, and it was the great degree of responsibility for them, because only three schools were selected in the whole country, and only about a dozen of teachers. And of course, the extreme, uh, extreme work overload for teachers, this is the constant um, thorough effort, extra efforts, extra mile they had to go for to deliver this, but they did this with great enthusiasm. So also some of the teachers noted that they had some language related problems, the language barrier, looking for the information at the UNESCO websites. Well, they were mostly available in English only. So they had to, well, it was a bit tough for them. Speaking about the students' feedback, well, they really enjoyed this newly proposed class format since they were more interactive, contained some specific tasks, games, master classes, some of the opportunity to do something with their own hands. So they really enjoyed these classes. Many of the students uh, realized that they started seeing difference between tangible and non-tangible heritage. Some of them could uh, uh, dive profoundly into this and learn more. Some of the students noted that they realized their role in passing ICH to the next generation, how, what, they, what an important role they play in passing it over. So also they mentioned the getting some of the new skills, some of them you know, learned the skill of suing, others started playing traditional games and so on. Speaking about the ICH classes or classes with the use of IT, ICH, most of the teachers wanted to concentrate to have the classes about ICH. And as Sonia mentioned, it was a kind of difficult because even teachers had to get a better understanding of the topic. So basically teaching and the spirit of global citizenship, it wasn't really always easy to implement these elements in the classes because there wasn't enough time to explain the concept itself. And they had to use more time to organize such classes or to have the whole series of classes. So the practical tasks, 
Well, these master classes and practical tasks, well, they uh, uh, cover the area related to traditional handicrafts. The teachers would provide some theory or the, uh, adding some skills and knowledge related to certain individual elements. Part one theory, part two, the students wanted to do something with their own hands. So as you can see, students using the pieces of wool, uh, pressed wool, they wanted to make some some useful stuff such as phone holders, little purses, and so on. Uh, to take these home, just to show that they uh, were able to do something with their own hands, they would produce a little pieces of art or would uh, simply enjoy some games. The conferences were dedicated to uh, two topics. Uh, the first one is uh, to uh, open up the uh, elements of the uh, verbal uh, heritage and uh, those ICH which are in the uh, inscripted, uh, inscribed in the uh, list of the uh, urgent uh, protection safeguarding uh, national uh, lists uh, which are available uh, in Kyrgyzstan. The format was also very interesting because the uh, students were uh, searching for the information and uh, they were uh, choosing the format in which uh, they would like to uh, tell us about this element. They were uh, studying the uh, element and then they were finding the um, uh, the information about it and uh, they were presenting uh, presenting it in the form of uh, singing, dancing, uh, etc. And uh, uh, of course, uh, here you see on the pictures our craftsmen and craftswomen uh, who were participating in our uh, lessons um, on a regular basis. Mainly it's uh, the uh, work uh, with uh, pressed wool and the traditional knowledge on embroidery. And the individual tasks for the children uh, is also a very time consuming and uh, very uh, difficult job for our teachers because uh, every student was proposed to uh, um, study one uh, ICH element and uh, to make a presentation of this element uh, for his uh, classmates. And uh, to the right, uh, uh, you see just uh, a little bit of what has been uh, designed by the uh, students during their uh, mini projects called My ICH. And uh, here you see some uh, works of the uh, uh, students. Uh, you see that they were uh, uh, drawing some uh, little books, uh, the children who were, uh, for example, picking up the topic of the uh, embroidery, uh, they tried to do the, uh, to embroider uh, the uh, fabrics. Uh, here you see, for example, the uh, picture uh, of uh, the soap, loaf of soap. And uh, uh, here uh, the topic was uh, the uh, healing, um, plants in uh, Kyrgyzstan when uh, she tried to learn more about the skills of the uh, Kyrgyz related to healing and to treatment of people uh, to uh, achieve some results. She decided to um, uh, collect uh, the um, various herbs and uh, uh, she uh, made a cake of um, uh, soap and uh, the parents were also helping her to um, uh, implement this project because her mother is uh, uh, the um, is also involved uh, into the uh, research of the um, uh, healing herbs uh, available in Kyrgyzstan, and uh, she helped her daughter. Uh, then we had some uh, general um, events, activities, uh, uh, mainly in the framework of Nauru celebrations. And here you see that the teachers uh, managed not only to uh, involve uh, the uh, teachers, uh, but also uh, the representatives of various uh, sporting associations who are promoting uh, different traditional uh, sports. And uh, here you see the representative of the Federation who were uh, providing their masterclass uh, both to the teachers and to the students. And here uh, to the right, uh, you see the girls who are playing Beshtash, which is a very a widely spread uh, traditional uh, Central Asian game. And uh, it can be stated that uh, thanks to the lesson uh, which was dedicated to this game, when the rules of the game were uh, explained to the students and to the teachers, the background of this game was also explained. And therefore, during the um, no rules celebrations, you see how girls are playing Bishtash. 
To the left, uh, you see uh, the um, picture of the lesson that was conducted in the framework of Nauru's uh, celebrations, which was conducted in uh, UNESCO Associated School. However, the approach there was really very interesting because uh, the whole school was involved uh, into the uh, Nauru's celebrations, starting from the primary school all the way uh, up to the secondary school. And this approach was uh, really very interesting because all the students were uh, proposed to uh, study one uh, ICH element and to make a presentation. The presentation was uh, made by the students. Therefore, it was a kind of teaching uh, by students to students. So when uh, the uh, higher grade uh, students are telling about their ICH element and they are uh, teaching the uh, students of the um, primary school and then they are um, turning over and uh, the uh, students of uh, lower grades are telling about their ICH element. As you see, the students were really very creative. And uh, uh, when they were celebrating no rules and uh, I would like to express my gratitude to the uh, schools and the uh, teachers for uh, their uh, creative approach to celebration of no rules in the new format. Uh, I would say that the organization of this celebration, this uh, festivity was really very uh, well done, uh, starting from the collection of the materials all the way down to uh, the printouts of uh, the materials. Uh, here you see uh, one of the students who is telling a story about the yurt. And uh, what was uh, really very interesting is uh, that he decided to print out everything, to uh, laminate uh, the printout and uh, uh, to bring uh, uh, this uh, poster to school. And uh, uh, the bearers, ICH uh, bearers, uh, were also participating in these uh, uh, festivities. Uh, you see them uh, on the right at the bottom. Uh, the ICH uh, museum uh, that was established there, I would like to thank the teachers and the uh, school administration who supported this idea. They exercised a very creative uh, approach to implementation of our project. And as a result, what we see, what we managed to achieve is a very good uh, result because the, t uh, the students managed not only to learn about ICH, but uh, as they mentioned in their uh, feedback, they managed to deep dive um, into uh, the ICH topic. And in this museum, we also conducted several lessons uh, on about uh, ICH and using ICH. And here uh, you see uh, the lesson, which is uh, related to some traditions and rituals um, related to children. And uh, it was also conducted uh, with participation of the ICH bearer. And, uh, I would like to state that uh, the idea of conducting the lessons uh, in museums was uh, um, uh, deemed to be very interesting, uh, not only for uh, the students of uh, schools, but also the uh, uh, teachers uh, of uh, kindergartens, as you see on the picture uh, at the right bottom. And um, uh, also uh, we uh, heard the stories about the difficulties that our students and teachers uh, were facing when they were collecting various elements, starting from the carpets uh, to uh, the musical instruments and traditional games, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of very interesting ICH uh, elements uh, that our teachers managed to create, and uh, of course, uh, it was. Uh, now feasible only thanks to the involvement of the family uh, members and uh, the relatives and uh, ICH bearers. And I would like to say that this uh, is uh, really representing a huge volume of work. And of course, the recommendations are uh, as follows uh, to uh, ensure sustainability of uh, uh, huge uh, work that was implemented But our teachers. Uh, we uh, would like uh, such uh, events or lessons in this uh, format to be introduced into the curriculum. Uh, those uh, might be, um, let's say, uh, the um, 
off uh, curriculum uh, events uh, that uh, uh, traditionally uh, were uh, used uh, to conduct the lessons on ICH. Uh, the support of the school administration is also a huge uh, plus in the course of project implementation because they were working from uh, scratch all the way until the end of the project. They were mobilizing the teachers, they were uh, collecting the ICH elements, and it was uh, a part and parcel of this project. And uh, the need uh, of financial support, I meant in the cases uh, uh, when, uh, for example, the situation with pandemic will enable us uh, to conduct uh, uh, some uh, classes uh, outside schools in the museums or uh, on sites because uh, many teachers during this uh, event said that they wanted to do something very interesting. They wanted to bring the uh, children to the sites and uh, to be able to touch uh, the uh, ICH elements and to have a feel of them. And of course, uh, uh, it uh, could also be uh, great to have more materials, especially adapted to the region of Central Asia on uh, uh, UNESCO conventions. And uh, of course, it could be great to uh, have a possibility to get a consultation or advice from the experts on the ICH because the teachers had a lot of questions when they were um, uh, describing the ICH elements. And this is the reason for which we had to remind them each time that the bearer of ICH is playing a paramount uh, uh, role. Uh, and uh, we have to do everything possible to underscore their role in the preservation, safeguarding, and uh, uh, rehabilitation of ICH elements. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we have to incentivize the uh, teachers. Uh, we have to incentivize the teachers because uh, uh, in spite of their very busy schedule and uh, routine workload, they uh, they exercised a very creative approach to the project implementation. And uh, we really have to thank them for uh, their very uh, steady and uh, uh, very industrious work. And uh, of course, we have to uh, raise awareness of all our teachers and schools about uh, UNESCO conventions and uh, the events that they're conducting in the area of education, culture, about the programs and uh, events, as well as uh, uh, capacity raising. And I would like to um, express uh, uh, my gratitude to uh, Bangkok uh, UNESCO office, to Almaty uh, UNESCO office, to Vanessa, to Aigul uh, uh, for uh, your support, continuous support in the project implementation. And of course, I would like to thank our teachers who with uh, uh, such enthusiasm and uh, creative approach managed to conduct uh, uh, this event and the framework of the project. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have uh, exhausted the time and uh, we have uh, one more presentation and then a Q&A. And this is uh, the reason for which I would like to pass the floor now to Ms. Natalia Milovanova, who will be talking about the experience of uh, introducing ICH in education in the secondary school. Natalia, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I would like to express my very deep feeling of gratitude to the organizers of this very interesting meeting and a possibility to uh, participate uh, in it. I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher of uh, history in uh, Dostar School and during our history classes, I would like to tell you about the uh, topics and uh, uh, materials and the sections that can be used uh, these are very uh, nice uh, resources of UNESCO that are available on uh, UNESCO site, uh, which uh, we find also in uh, ICH uh, lists uh, and World Heritage uh, lists. And uh, if I may, I would like to talk not only about ICH, but I would like also to talk uh, a little bit about the global heritage. Uh, the initial topics uh, that we are introducing in the fifth grade on the history of Kazakhstan and the global history, world history, is uh, related to culture. And uh, you can uh, go through the screen and you will see all the topics uh, on the history of uh, Kazakhstan. Here is the world history, which uh, is uh, not uh, surprising. For example, if you take the industrial uh, revolution uh, uh, can uh, be found uh, and uh, we can uh, refer to very interesting UNESCO uh, resources and uh, in the fifth grade uh, we are also familiarizing our teachers with the uh, 
uh, list of uh, uh, global um, uh, cultural heritage of uh, UNESCO. And of course, uh, we are talking here about our Shetamgal, uh, Tamgali. Uh, Tamgali is uh, the first uh, ICH uh, uh, object uh, from Kazakhstan, which was uh, inscribed in uh, the uh, World Heritage uh, List. Uh, and uh, we are familiarizing the uh, students of the fifth grade uh, on the World Heritage List of UNESCO, on the site of UNESCO and uh, the, uh, the way it looks like. And of course, I'm using the materials which are uh, available uh, uh, on uh, the page of Tamgali uh, site. And uh, we give an opportunity to our students to uh, teach, uh, to uh, learn more about the illustrations because uh, very often, uh, of course, uh, they can um, learn about it because uh, it's not a part of our uh, current environment, but nevertheless, uh, they can learn about the uh, dyes, about the materials. And uh, then I'm providing an opportunity to uh, my students to play the role of the artists, and uh, they are uh, actually um, painting the uh, paintings in uh, Tamgali uh, style. And also there is a video which is available on the same site. We have uh, been watching uh, without sound, uh, uh, this uh, video, and then uh, using the material av available in our textbooks, we uh, wanted to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, to sound this uh, video, and also we uh, took a look at uh, various elements of uh, ICH uh, that uh, um, are represented by our country. Therefore, it is uh, just the introductory step, which is going to uh, follow up in the next grade. In the sixth grade, there is a very interesting topic, uh, which is dedicated to the uh, Silk Road. And uh, we are conducting several uh, very interesting projects. For example, one of the projects is called uh, Select the um, uh, Goods uh, for uh, the Trade Caravan from Taras to Tashkent. And the second group uh, is uh, uh, was picking up uh, the uh, goods uh, uh, following on their route from Tashkent to Taraz. And uh, they were putting together a map. And uh, for this, uh, they had to use the uh, list of the world uh, heritage uh, as well as uh, ICH uh, uh, list. And uh, we decided that we are going to advertise our goods. This is the reason for which our students were working very actively with both lists. Uh, and uh, here you see the elements of uh, ICH uh, from Central Asian countries with which our students were familiarizing themselves. And uh, here is uh, the uh, UNESCO site and the map uh, uh, on which uh, we uh, were uh, putting together a route through the ancient cities of uh, Kazakhstan, which are sitting on the uh, Silk Road. Uh, and uh, we were representing uh, uh, such uh, cities as uh, uh, and therefore, the children not only were uh, reading uh, something from the textbook, but they were uh, learning uh, a lot more uh, in their practice about the Great Silk Road. In addition, the mausoleum of uh, Hoja Ahmed Yasavi is uh, a sacred uh, site for all the um, uh, nations of the Central Asian, and uh, we have the materials in the sixth grade and uh, in the seventh grade, and uh, we uh, try to learn more about this uh, uh, historic monument, and we were reading through the materials of UNESCO, and uh, the students had to uh, watch the materials available uh, on the UNESCO site, and then uh, the clean board uh, task was implemented by the children when, uh, for example, uh, we uh, put various um, numbers and then the uh, uh, students were uh, selecting a number and they were telling based on the video that they were watching beforehand, uh, they were uh, telling about various uh, historic uh, monuments. And uh, here, for example, we they had to provide the, an answer of why this mausoleum is included into the World Heritage List of UNESCO. I think that it is very important for the students not only to learn about the availability of various uh, World Heritage uh, sites, uh, but uh, also to understand why they are so important today and why we have to know about them and what they give us uh, to the new uh, generations, to the young generations. This is the reason for which we are trying to summarize everything and to uh, create a link with the uh, current life uh, with, uh, uh, and uh, try to understand how it can functionally help us. In the 10th grade, there is a big uh, uh, section which is uh, called uh, uh, the moral and uh, um, 
uh, moral uh, values of the modern society and uh, we uh, were scrutinizing the World Heritage List and ICH uh, list of UNESCO and then in the groups we put together kind of uh, symbolic small presentations uh, which were dedicated to the uh, symbol uh, symbols of uh, cultural uh, unity of uh, the peoples of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. And uh, the uh, children had an algorithm of their work. They could do it as a presentation or a live project. We did it last year when we were uh, had uh, all our classes uh, online, but it was uh, done very well. So as part of this project, we also tried to do uh, the uh, video contest. Well, uh, the time is at Funchit Limited. It was called Use for the Youth. We basically made this setting that in a simple language, but interesting language, understandable for the youth, our students wanted to show some of the important ICH elements for uh, just to be able to motivate some interest. We have the school television, and those videos were played back for a few weeks in different classes. So this year we're going to have the second video contest. So these guys, they got really interested and they're already doing some work right now. Speaking about the global history, well, there is a huge list of possibilities starting from grade five. For instance, we did the historical auction, the UNESCO World Heritage List, uh, the history of the ancient world. Uh, the students would get these pictures and they had to use the UNESCO website to define what are the World Heritage Sites shown here. And now we're going to work not just with the sites, but we're also going to be adding some more interesting ICH elements. In grade five, uh, the promotion of ICH, this was the culture of ancient India. So basically, uh, we, I, uh, made, uh, I produced several puzzles, like question, what kind of bottles was the greatest in India, Pranayama? Well, basically, uh, uh, this was part of the India's ICH. So the uh, students would find some interesting information, respond to these puzzles, and, well, basically, which, uh, this is the victory board. So it was really amazing and really involving. This was some piece of work on Egypt. Do you believe that? That was the question. Uh, the students would receive such posters. And on those posters, there would be old cultural heritage sites from ancient Egypt. So the students had to find some information, respond to the questions, and give it to their uh mates so basically really they really enjoyed this piece of work and we also added a brainstorm we used this particular page where all of this uh, uh, cultural sites of egypt are listed and by looking at them and by studying some materials we also try to propose some other cultural heritage sites which are not made official yet, but might potentially become part of that list. So the students could show their analytical skills by training to explain why this or that other facility has not yet been included. Uh, these are the cities of the world. This is grade five. So this looks like a game. The cities of the ancient world, uh, the whole cities that were also included as part of the world heritage list in the form of a puzzle. Students would guess these puzzles and they would also provide some information, telling some interesting facts about those ancient cities. This is grade seven, the more serious stuff, the board of knowledge that is called. Uh, well, basically they here, they show some illustrations. Illustrations that feature old heritage sites from various countries in the East. So the students had to define what country that would be coming from and explain why what was the reasoning or value for the inclusion of these sites in the World Heritage List. So basically this looks like uh, the PDF format, then we'll print it out, all of this stuff. The, in the extracurricular fashion, we had the group quests called Treasures of the World. Again, as you can see here, you can see some of the architectural sites. And this is the page we started with. The questions were school wide. Well, they were hidden in the school building all across the school. 
everywhere in the school building, in different classes, uh, the kids would find those, uh, uh, well, hidden questions, respond to these hidden questions. These are some of the pictures, uh, students finding questions, finding answers, and here they're shooting a video. So they had not just to speak as a quest participant, those who search and find information, they also had to present this information and feel like a journalist. Some interesting information, industrial revolution in England, grade eight. The topic seems to be far away from the world heritage, far from world heritage list. But basically we're talking about the key reasons behind this industrial revolution. Turns out that the first still made bridge in the world the first furnace, blast furnaces, and steel mills, where they all now become became part of the world heritage list. So be specifically, we're working based on this material. The topic of culture, grade nine, culture and science, the first half of the 20th century. Here we used not just the information about some of the heritage sites, but also tried to find some information about the elements of Ice Age. So as you can see, I would gladly uh, invite some of the carriers, but in this conditions of pandemics, it's really hard, uh, next to impossible. So we, I will tell you about the idea for this year. We'll try to make it happen. Culture and science in the first half of the 20th century, also grade nine, the continuation of this previous project, coming up with the list of the five key achievements in different areas based on the UNESCO listings, not just cultural and heritage sites, but also technical uh, achievements, uh, well, historical facilities, and make a video as a presentation. Grade 10, we have this topic, UNESCO and World Cultural Heritage. So basically uh, for about five classes, what we've done, we actively study the information about the world heritage um, and Intangible cultural heritage, ICH. This is again one of the topics of ICH. We analyzed the information, showed graphically, dynamically, because this is already grade 10. So basically, we came up with the lists of the world cultural heritage sites, tried to understand where which country has the most of these facilities, why, what are the reasons behind this. Also, one more interesting point, we just came up with it with this recently, just at the beginning of the school year. The as one of the ICH elements, Mediterranean diet as one of those. I included this element and its topic life in the um, Middle Ages in the rural areas or urban areas. So basically in a class, we tried to serve a table of an ancient human, human living in the Middle Ages. What kind of foodstuffs could possibly be available on their table? And basically we tried to connect this to the reality. How, come, how can these foods now help us avoid any illnesses, pandemics and be, to stay healthy. So we came up with the list of foodstuffs, which we still use uh, up till now on our table, regardless of the fact that it's called Mediterranean diet. Even here in Kazakhstan, it's also being actively practiced. So these are some of the foods that are being served today, the modern human's diet. So on this good note, I'd like to finish with this uh, uh, sort of table picture also as part of our future plans. Right now we are also preparing the second video contest. This is gonna be in the uh, closer to the end of the year. Also like to have another tournament amongst grade nine. One of the elements of ICH is this Kazakh national game secure. secure. This is not going to be just a tournament. We will have it for some a bunch of interesting meetings, meetings, study the rules, and then so we'll have some practical games. Also, by the end of the year, hopefully it works out, we'll have this interactive panorama uh, called Live Heritage. Today I heard the, uh, from the previous speakers and it was really interesting to learn more. And uh, what you came up, we actually almost hit your target because we'd like to invite some of the ICH carriers and organize 
some of the activities with these people, life heritage panorama to enable kids not just to see it, but also try to do something with their own hands. Of course, we're limited by the terms of the school curriculum, extracurriculum activities, so well, but in the class settings, well, you can spend a little time, you can spend a few minutes. So gradually in a step-by-step -step fashion, we'll do this and it's gonna be interesting for kids. But what's most important, uh, why do we need all of this? Why do we need to care? Children must understand what's the importance of these achievements, this uh, ICH, uh, intangible, intangible heritage, why we need this in order to be able to form global citizens, in order to have some tolerance, sympathy. This is a multi-ethnic state, so we really need this. Thank you, I'm done. Time, but we had some really interesting presentations. Thank you very much to all of our distinguished speakers. While we had presentations, we only had one particular question in our chat. So I'll probably address this, Ms. Sunia Bajaneva. The question is from Vasily Shekbulari. Are there any pedagogical guidelines for the ICH in a formal school curriculum? Well, I think Natalia already responded to this question because the UNESCO website, like, I, like they said it, they basically produce the materials that have been developed by UNESCO. So what we need to do, it's always possible to adopt these materials to your curriculum setting because they are openly available. So this is my answer. I also would like to thank Natalia Nanimna because we also had this session with our teachers who are part of this project. Natalia Ananiva shared her experience. So I just sit here and get really impressed with what you do. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Since we don't have any further questions, we'll probably be winding up. I would like to ask uh, Ms. Aigul Halafova, uh, the our specialist on cultural issues, to say a few words in conclusion. And on my own behalf, I'd like to thank all of the speakers, our interpreters, our tech support, and all of our distinguished audience li listeners. Thank you. Thank you, Major. Hello, distinguished participants. Hello, distinguished audience, I'm very pleased to see our distinguished colleagues from the sector of culture, pleased to see colleagues from the sector of education, specifically from the associated schools of UNESCO, from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, with whom I, whom I know personally and had the pleasure of working with you in the past. So thank you very much for joining. A great thanks and the words of appreciation to the ministries of education and culture who are present specifically from the Republic of Tajikistan. Thank you very much for finding time. I think the materials that have been presented, this is a reach and experience of the lessons learned. And thanks to our national commissions on UNESCO Affairs. Thank you for supporting this initiative, UNESCO, Almaty, and ICH COP to join our efforts to join uh, to these education and culture. Because to, for the personnel, it's a development for the human development. We need to make sure that we develop both education and culture uh, in parallel or concurrently. So basically to create uh, spiritual values that we all need and care about. Also I'd like to remind you why are we actually having this event? Why we're having this joint initiative with ICH Cup in our cluster bureau. Starting from 2018 globally, we've been having this, we've been having this consolidation or some joint work of two sectors, education and culture. Of course, there are various initiatives, and of course, this is one of the small initiatives working in the Asia Pacific, I mean, region of Central Asia, that is basically a little contribution to both the development, uh, the global level, I mean, now programs, and also the development in the Asia Pacific. Today, we simply tried to show you the results of some of the pilot projects, some of the pilot steps that we've been making here in this region of Central Asia. All of this has been delivered in a highly abridged form. A lot more work has been done, interesting work. A lot is still uh, coming up 
in the future. A lot of work is still ahead of us. So the sector of culture. So we'll need to do something jointly, some joint understanding of these common efforts. So today we're all here together. Uh, but generally the initiative to implement, uh, well, ICH, we started this back in 2018, started a pilot project to, to jointly with uh, ICH Cup, but Cup, but for the professional education, not a pilot project. This is already one of the next phases that we're trying to disclose for teachers, for experts in education and culture. We're trying to reveal these two areas to each other, to show the points, to cooperate, or how we can help our youth. Speaking about the last presentation, by Ms. Natalia Ananievna. This was a yet another standalone project of our office. This is not uh, the, within the framework of this project for Asian Pacific. Our office back in 2019 opened and developed this, uh, this special website for the youth cast space, the space for Central Asia, for the Central Asian youth in each of our sectors, each of our departments, they developed specific part for the common guidelines. So Natalia Ananima used to be one of the key developers who developed this element of culture. So that's where we try to disclose these topics, provide some practical tasks for trainers. This could be used by teachers too. So Natalia Ananima basically showed how these materials can actually be used based on the examples of the subject of history. So of course, depending on, depending on the every teacher's mindset or fantasy limits, could use the websites of UNESCO, both of our office, uh, Bangkok UNESCO, UNESCO Bangkok and the global website. They are really filled with the extra information, you need to have some desire, you need to understand certain mechanisms inside your school, inside your particular subject to be able to integrate ICH into it. So today we tried and I think it worked really worked out as possible to integrate ICH into the school curriculum. You can integrate various points on the world cultural heritage also possible. I kind of hope that it really worked out for us. So I'll be very pleased to receive your feedback, your reactions, and hopefully today, well, you spend two and a half hours with us. Uh, this is no waste of time. Thank you very much to everyone again. Uh, goodbye and... Uh...